Today, I would like to share with you a training principle that absolutely transformed my life and transformed the way I approached long distance triathlon training that allowed me to reach my goals and to far exceed what I thought was possible with my body and my performance. I'm talking about zone two training. Welcome back to the channel, welcome back to a new video. My background is not as an athlete, my background is from a sedentary person who works a desk job. I had no background in swimming, I would cycle, I would just commute in the city and I was running distances from five to six kilometers, maybe twice or three times a week just as a way to exercise. But then I got it into my mind that I wanted to do an Ironman 70.3 and I realized that the fundamental thing that I needed to do was to increase the time that I could spend moving, be it swimming, cycling or running. That was absolutely paramount. That is what I needed to do. And with the single goal I had of going longer and farther, zone two was absolutely the best thing that I could ever discover to accomplish this goal and to prepare my body for what I really wanted to do. For context, I would like to share with you what my training was like before encountering zone two. So as a complete noob, I basically just would run and cycle as hard as I could. I would go out of the house and I would just run for a loop, like six, seven kilometers hard. I would ride my bike, hard, always the same thing. I would go out, just get outside and go as hard as I could. I felt great and it felt like I was really getting a workout in. I would do the distance that I set out to do, so maybe seven or eight kilometers running and I would be smashed after, absolutely wrecked. I couldn't do anything else. And this led to being inconsistent with training because maybe I would train one day, but I couldn't the day after that. And overall, I noticed that as the months progressed, I was not getting any performance benefits. So I was always running the same loops or riding the same loops, not really getting anywhere. Then I very, very luckily heard about Zone 2 training. I heard about Zone 2 training in the Rich Roll podcast, which is an incredible podcast and its host, Rich Roll, is a very accomplished ultra endurance athlete. He participated in one of the most grueling events on earth, which is Ultraman in Hawaii and did a bunch of other stuff. And in his podcast with his coach, Chris Houth, who now has his own podcast, The Weekly Word, which I highly recommend. Rich Roll and Chris Health would explain how training at a low intensity, zone two, which is basically the aerobic zone, could greatly impact our ability to go for long periods of time at a low intensity. If we're willing to put in the volume, the volume necessary must be high. So the intensity would be low, but the overall volume would be high. They would always describe it as an easy effort. And I was really puzzled. I was like, how can this be true? How can this work? How can it be that if you go easier, you get better, you progress? But these were two kind of idols of mine. So I decided to really start researching and diving deeper into zone two training in order to then test it out on myself and see where it would lead me. Before I explain to you all that I learned with my research and how it directly affected my training. I would like to share with you the first day that I started implementing zone two training and heart rate training in my life because I still remember it vividly. It was an incredible experience. What happened is I decided to implement the zone two protocol in my life. So I laced up my shoes and I headed out of the house, but this was gonna be a different training session. I was going for a run, but I was going to pay strict attention to my heart rate. I was gonna set a heart rate cap just as zone two training says, I would focus on running at the intensity that my aerobic system could tolerate for long periods of time. I was not gonna run on feel, but I was running on heart rate. Using an online calculator, I'd figured out my aerobic cap, placed roughly at around 155 beats per minute. This sounded ridiculously low for what I was used to. I was used to heading out of the door and running at 170 beats per minute, minimum. I also set out without a distance in mind. I was going to run until my body felt like running, until I had the energy for it. And something incredible happened. I felt like I could run forever. I ran and the distance just kept on racking up. I got to seven kilometers, eight kilometers, I was feeling great. Nine kilometers, 10 kilometers soared by, I was still feeling full of energy. 11, 12, 13, 14 kilometers. And by this point, my legs were destroyed, but my overall energy was still there. I could have gone longer if my legs had allowed me to do it. I had literally just run a distance that I would run in the total of a week, just on a random midweek morning. I felt absolutely no cardio fatigue. My legs were pretty demolished, but my overall physiology wasn't. I didn't feel wrecked. This was amazing. I realized that zone two could be an incredible tool in my arsenal that would allow me to reach my goal. So I kept on digging and researched even deeper. I wanted to learn as much as I could on all things zone two training. So exactly what is zone two training? Zone two training is a structured training protocol based on heart rate. 
Zone two is typically the lowest heart rate zone used for training purposes. The key metric is max HR, the maximum amount of beats per minute that our heart can do. From there, we can figure out our zone two, which is roughly around 60 to 70% of our max heart rate. The purpose behind zone two training is to be able to sustain an aerobic effort under our aerobic threshold for 30 plus minutes. This is the definition. And I understood that this was vital for anyone who was approaching a goal like a middle distance triathlon or a long distance triathlon. Because in order to sustain an effort for five hours or longer without crashing and burning, this was an absolutely fundamental piece of the puzzle to solve and to understand and to implement. It was at this point that I understood the importance of pacing. So zone two training requires, as a first thing, setting your, the top end of your zone two. This can be done in two ways. One is extremely simple and requires no gadgets. And that is just to understand that zone two is when you can exercise and move while maintaining a conversation. It might be a bit hard, but you can maintain a conversation while you are doing this exercise. That's why people refer to this as exercising at a conversational pace. The second way is to use an online calculator. I personally used the Triathlon Taran online heart rate calculator. I believe that compared to other online calculators, it gives some values which personally were more in line with myself. So it gave a slightly higher zone two cap. And this compared to others, which would give me like 135 or values like that, which was extremely, extremely low. Maybe they were better, but I found great, great benefit by using uh, a 155 heart rate cap on the run. On the bike, that would be a bit lower. It would be around two, three, four beats per minute lower. The gadgets that I used were the usual. So a heart rate strap, and a GPS watch. The GPS watch would be just to monitor my heart rate and the heart rate strap is to have precise reading of what our heart is doing. I would definitely recommend the second route compared to going on feel, but that's totally up to you. Other ways of figuring out your zone two cap would be to do mile repeats, Cooper test, but I haven't done them so I can't really speak for them. In this video, I'm only speaking about experience, what I have done on myself and so that I have tangible things to say and things that might be useful based on hard facts on truth. So my objective with training a lot in zone two was basically to make my body more efficient in that zone. So I would put in the low intensity, high volume work day after day in an effort to get my body to be more efficient at the same heart rate. And I could monitor this weekly by doing the same run loop or the same cycling loop and see that while I was maintaining the same heart rate, 150, 155 cap, I was getting faster Week after week, this was the progress that I was seeing, literally before my eyes. And this is only one of the many benefits of Zone 2. I'm not a doctor and I'm not an exercise physiologist, but I did a lot of research. And this is basically some of the things that I found out. Our bodies use different energy systems, aerobic and anaerobic. We vary between these at different intensities. In order to supply energy to our muscles, in the form of adenosine triphosphate, ATP, which enables muscle contraction. In the aerobic zone, what is zone two? The body utilizes both fat and carbohydrate in order to supply energy. These two energy sources get utilized in varying percentages based on the intensity. So a very low intensity effort will utilize a higher percentage of fat compared to carbohydrate, whereas a higher end aerobic effort will start utilizing more carbohydrate compared to the percentage of fat that it uses until we reach a crossover where the body cannot use fat to provide energy for muscle contraction because it needs it faster. So it will switch over to carbohydrate as its main primary source of energy. So for lower intensity, it is something between 55 and 75% of VO2 max. And here what it utilizes is both carbohydrate and fat in varying amounts, depending on the intensity to provide the muscles with ATP. When we go past 75% of VO2 max, what happens is the carbohydrate utilization increases greatly because the body needs faster energy in order to keep on sustaining the effort. Anything above 100% of VO2 max, carbohydrate is the main and basically only energy source that is utilized. The second thing that came out in my research is that basically we have two types of muscle fibers, slow twitch and fast twitch. Slow twitch that are used at lower intensities, at fast twitch that are used at higher intensities for rapid movement. And by training in zone two, we greatly stimulate the type one, which are slow twitch muscle fibers, which are what are needed for long endurance efforts. Stimulating type one muscle fibers and training in zone two is going to directly stimulate 
mitochondrial growth and in these muscle fibers, allowing for the body to become way more efficient at utilizing fat for energy. The body becoming more efficient at utilizing fat for energy is gonna mean that the body will be able to preserve glycogen, so it will use less glycogen at the intensity that we have trained it for. And this in turn means that preserving glycogen will allow us to go for longer periods of time because these stores will get depleted way slower. Being able to utilize fat as our primary energy source at higher intensities is something that's called fat max oxidation. Fat max oxidation is the point in which we are still using fat as our primary source. So being able to increase the intensity in which we can burn a lot of fat for fuel is a great thing because we will preserve carbohydrate. So a higher fat max directly means maintaining a higher intensity aerobic effort for longer periods of time. Zone two is a perfect way to train fat max oxidation. And another trick that I used after talking with coaches and athletes was to do some training sessions fasted early in the morning, first thing in the morning, to simulate a sort of a train low, race high approach or carbohydrate periodization approach that a lot of people are doing these days, but without changing anything in my diet. I could keep on eating whatever I wanted, carbohydrate, and I would do these fasted early morning sessions in order to replicate the carbohydrate periodization approach. Zone two training is a high volume training protocol. So I made sure to include at least three or four days during the week, during the training schedule, that were purely zone two. Another concept that ties into zone two training is polarized training, 80-20 or 95-5. This basically means that 80% of the time we are doing an easy effort and 20% of the time we are doing some tempo or let's call it some quality work, something that has intensity. This gets pushed to an extreme with polarized approach, which is 95-5. So 95% of the time you go easy and 5% you go all out, 100% effort, like really hard effort. And this is supposed to be a great way to train and it is how I did it. I varied between 80-20 and 95-5 or 90-10 because I felt that Greatly improving zone two was the, the best thing that I could do and the thing that I should invest more time in and more energy in. And the rest of the time would be a small amount varying between 20 and 5% where I would do some intensity. A, because it's just fun to go hard on the bike, especially. I didn't do it on the run. On the run, I always kept it chill, but on the bike, I would just go all out like ham uh, with time trials or intervals or some really hard tempo sessions, like with long, long tempo sections. And I did this also because I did want to improve my top speeds. So I not only wanted to get more efficient, but I wanted to get faster. Of course, everybody wants to do that. The other thing with polarized training and 80-20 is that it supposedly allows you to train less or at least get like the, just the right amount of time that you need in a week in order to get the maximum benefits you can. I'm not kidding anyone, I'm not a pro athlete. I just, I really suck actually. So the thing is to squeeze out as much as I can with the time that I have available and the resources and the energy that I have, which is gonna be very different from those of a professional athlete. The fact that I chose to train longer hours and I spend so much time on the bike is just because I love it. I really like riding my bike and I like being outside. So I chose to invest more time doing actually zone two just by riding the bike. I believe that the bike is the number one way to approach zone two training. Riding a bike is a way to really and greatly improve our aerobic capacity because it is just so varied. We can go hard for a while, we can recover for a while, we can vary between aerobic zones and we don't get smashed like on the run. Doing a three hour effort on a run, even if it is aerobic, it's gonna tax us like crazy. Doing a three hour aerobic effort on a bike it's nothing. You can do that back to back, day after day, without feeling wrecked. So I believe that the bike was the instrumental piece that helped me to greatly increase my zone two performance. And I'm not the only one to say this. Uh, Rich Roll also said this, and Chris Halp as well. They always say that the bike is so, so important to approach building the aerobic capacity that we all have in ourselves. So I would spend a lot of time on the bike doing zone two, but I would also do some intensity workouts. Also with the swim, I spent one swim that was absolutely aerobic, but I would do another two swims which were different types of effort. One was kind of like max efforts, but on a kind of longer distance, so 200 meters. And the other one would be like a tempo effort, four by 400, and every week I would increase. So it would be four by 400, five by 400, six by 400, and so on in an Ironman training block. The run is something that I chose to approach with a minimum effective dose protocol. So I would run as little as possible, getting the best results that I could. So 
I wasn't going to kid myself. I was not going to get super good improvements on the run. I just decided to try and approach it in a kind of like a smart way. So I decided to only do zone two on the run. I would not do any intensity because intensity is where you usually get injured and I wanted to avoid that as much as possible. So I only did zone two intensity on the run. Another thing that I did was to often do brick sessions. So I would split it up between bike and run. I would do a total time of let's say three hours. I would do two hours bike, one hour run or one 90 minutes bike, 30 minutes run. That would allow me to stay more time in zone two because the key thing is time in zone. Over the course of a week, I would have a total time in zone two that would amount to, I don't know, seven hours, eight hours, nine hours, depending on the week. And I would have a total amount of time in different zones, so zone four, zone five, that would account to like 10, 15, 5% of the whole total weekly volume in time, not in distance. One other thing that I would like to say is that I attribute a lot of my zone two fitness actually to the fact that I would commute every day by bike, 30 minutes, one hour. Even if I trained, I would be commuting 30 minutes, one hour, one hour and a half every day. At low intensities. I would just be riding my bike around town, super zone two. I wouldn't count those in the total training volume for the week, but in retrospect, I think that really, really helped a lot because it was just stacking up hours and hours of zone two. Really easy effort, but that produced some results. Even if it wasn't structured training, I think it really delivered some results. So bike commuting in my book, definitely not needed but I think it can have a really cool byproduct in increasing our fitness. So after all this talking, I would like to show you exactly what a zone two training week looked like for me. This is basically week one of the Ironman training block that I did for Ironman Tallinn. And it is structured through a mix of help from some mentors of mine, coaches, and athletes whose opinion and experience I really, really value and they help me to kind of create this training plan. So here is a sample zone two Ironman training week structure. The swimming was divided in one interval swim, one technique swim, and one aerobic long swim. Cycling consisted of one interval session or a time trial, one long tempo session. So by long, I mean both in total duration and in the tempo interval duration. And then I would have three zone two efforts, including a long ride. For the run, I had two runs per week, one midweek run and one longish weekend run. One of these two runs would be a brick session. And actually towards the end, both of them would be brick sessions. Okay, so let's see the specific session. Monday would be day off. One day off per week, mandatory. That's what I decided to do. And that's what I think really works well for recovery. And everybody told me take at least one day off. So Mondays would be off. Tuesday would be bike intervals. In this specific week, it was the first week. So it was three times, three minutes at 300 watts. I would do these on an uphill. I had some segments where I would go and I would increase these every week, either by time or by watts. So the first week would be three by three minutes at 300 watts. The week after that would be three by four minutes at 300 watts or three by three minutes at 330 watts, something along those lines. Usually once a month, the interval session would be a time trial, depending on where my fitness was at between 10 minutes and 20 minutes. Sometimes I would do this for FTP testing sessions. I would just do a 20 minute time trial, which is brutal. I would never recommend anyone do it, but sometimes I would do it. If I could go back, I would just do a ramp test like everybody does. Also because I think that a 20 minute all out TT is really taxing on the mind also. So you have to be really, really in tune with your mind and how hard you can go and how hard you can push yourself. Wednesday would be kind of like an interval swim. So it would be a total of 2,300 meters with a 300 meter warm up, 400 meters technique, and the rest would be subdivided in 200 meter intervals. So it would be 200 meters as fast as I could go, like a 90% effort. At lunchtime, I would have an eight kilometer run, completely zone two, completely heart rate based, keeping my cap of 155 and not even looking at the pace. I would just go by heart rate. Thursday would be a zone two bike session. Two hours on the bike, zone two. Just riding at an aerobic effort, nothing too taxing. Friday would be swim technique and swim tempo. So I would do 300 meter warm up, 
400 meters of technique, really diligent and with a lot of drills. So a lot of catch-up freestyle, a lot of toys, a lot of gliding, all that stuff, which will lead me into a four by 400 meter tempo kind of effort. And the thing is the 400 meters would be performed with as little rest as possible with 100 meters free, 100 meters pool boy, 100 meters paddle and 100 meters free. All of these performed with as little rest as possible and at a moderate to high intensity that would allow me to do the 400 meters without actually dying and then recover one minute and perform the next four by 400. Then after the swim, I would have at lunchtime, one hour easy on the bike that will usually become 90 minutes or two hours because I just love riding outside. But the key word here is easy. It's just time on the bike, basically. So Saturday would be the long tempo effort on the bike. So that would look like maybe two hours to two hours and a half on the bike, including something like two by 10 minutes at race pace. What do I mean by race pace? I don't actually mean pace, but I mean power. So this could be done anywhere. It could be done on incline. It could be done on the flat. It could be done on a road bike, on a gravel bike, on a tri bike. Just basically focus on doing two by 10 minutes at intended race power, the power I wanted to hold during the race. So this would vary between 70.3 and Ironman, or if I were doing another race, any race, this would be different based on that. So if I were going into a 70.3, it would be higher power. If it, I was going into an Ironman, it would be uh, easier power. Like, I don't know, you know, even 180, 200 watts is a lot for an Ironman. So yeah, Saturday bike long intensity, kind of like tempo effort. I would follow this bike with the long run. So I would do a long run, not that long actually, because I would focus on doing a brick so that I could have the same duration, the same time and zone, but without having to tax my body too much on the run. So in this specific case, I did 13 kilometers, zone two, purely zone two, based on heart rate after the bike. So I would get a lot of intensity on the bike and then I would go run. Is this the best strategy? I don't know. For me, it worked. Some way it worked, but I don't know if I would really recommend this to anyone but in my specific case it worked. So Sunday would be a long swim and a long bike. In this specific case it was early in the season so I would do this in the pool because it was winter and it was six by 500 meters zone two. So purely aerobic effort. So one thing I would do especially in the beginning of the season would be to perform this long swim breaking it up yes into 500 meter blocks but what I would do is alternate 500 meters freestyle and 500 meters with a pool boy and a band. Then switch back to freestyle and then a pool boy again, freestyle, pool boy. And I would do this because I wanted to simulate as much of the race fatigue in the arms that I could. So get as close as possible to the distance, especially in the arms and shoulders. Some people say you shouldn't do this, that you shouldn't swim any distance, that you can't swim just by doing freestyle because you don't have the proper technique. I completely disagree with this. I believe that getting as close as possible to feeling the fatigue that you're gonna feel on the race day is a very, very important factor. And that's why I would implement this strategy. And this strategy I think works very well for simulating the fatigue in the arms, which is something that needs to be reckoned with. And the other thing is, yes, you are not using your core because you're having the aid of a pool boy. So it's gonna help with all the lower body problems that you might have with your technique, but you are getting the distance in the shoulders. I personally chose to simulate as much as possible the race distance and the race fatigue because that's what I was going to feel on race day. I knew that it was going to be a wetsuit legal race. So every open water swim that I did, well, not all of them, but most of them I did with a wetsuit. I suck at swimming, so I'm going to take any help that I can. My goal was not to become a good swimmer. My goal was to become a triathlete. Following the long swim, I would have a long bike ride so completely zone two and this would vary depending on where i was in the block between two and a half three and a half four hours five hours six hours up to i think the longest i did was six and a half hours building up ironman race and that is a completely zone two effort another thing i would do as i did with the swim was the closer I was getting to the race, I would simulate the race conditions as much as possible. So I would do the exact same bike course or similar. So if it was hilly, I would do hills. If it was flat, I would do flat. Same thing for the swim, I would try and swim in a lake. And same thing I tried to do for the run, but it didn't really work out because I should have trained more on hills. So I believe this training structure can work very well. It worked very well on me, so I'm gonna keep on doing it. And these distances can be scaled down to 70.3. 
Basically, I created this template so that I could just stay fit. I could stay fit to participate in events that I would like when they popped up. And the really cool thing with a template like this is that it can really prepare you for a huge variety of events. So triathlons, 70.3, you can scale up to Ironman. You can use it for bike races. You can use it for running races, half marathons. You will be fit if you follow this thing. That was my goal. Right now, I would keep on doing it if I could. I'm injured, so I need to address that first, but I'm definitely going back to some type of training like this when I can. Right now, it's only zone two on the bike, which is good because you keep your fitness up, but it's just not as fun. It's not as fun as having some intensity. It's not as fun as varying everything. So I look forward to getting some intensity back as well, like hill climbing and all that kind of stuff. In my experience, the keys to endurance events are fat max oxidation, nutrition, and being able to pace myself. So being able to understand how hard I can go without overdoing it and without killing myself. And this relies heavily on the training that has been done because in the training, I can understand what my limits are. So I can understand how hard I can go and how to pace myself. And zone two training, I think provides a very, very solid base to stack performance on top of. Cool resources on Zone 2 Training are Ritual, Chris Health, Training Peaks has some good articles on it. 8020 is absolutely awesome. 8020 plan, training plans, they're really legit. And another big resource is Math Method, Mathetone Method. It's a bit more, I think, complex than other types of Zone 2 Training and maybe a bit less appealing. I don't know how to put it, but kind of like less cool. But following those principles will yield great results, I believe. So all in all, Zone 2 boils down to make your easy sessions easy and your hard sessions hard with a polarized training approach. Oh, so there you have it. That is my video on Zone 2 training. I've been meaning to make this video for a really long time because Zone 2 training really impacted my life and I believe it was an instrumental piece of me being where I am today. Doing the, even if they're mini school goals and accomplishments, what I've done up to this day, because I started from nothing and I managed to improve to something. And I really, really need to thank Zone 2 Training for this. Let me know what you think. If you were on the fence on trying Zone 2 Training, maybe this video will give you an input to try and do it and see for yourself if you have any benefits. Thanks for tuning in as always, and I hope to see you in the next video here on the channel. See ya.